Parts was having a good day. Mother was getting over that touch of flu and was up this morning for breakfast at the table. Her husband, Raymond Parks, one of the best barbers in the country, had been asked to take on extra work at the Air Force Base. And the first day of December was always special because you could just feel Christmas in the air. Everybody knew the alterations department would soon be very, very busy. Miss Parks would laugh each year with the other seamstress and say, Those else in the North Pole have nothing on us. The women of Montgomery, both young and older, would come in with their fancy holiday dresses that needed adjustments or their Sunday suits and blouses that just needed a little touch. A flower or some velvet trimming or something to make the ladies look festive. Rosa Parks was the best seamstress. The needle and thread flew through her hands like the gold spinning from Rumpelstiltskin's loom. The other seamstress would tease Rosa and say she used magic. Rosa would laugh, not magic, just concentration, she would say. Some day she would skip lunch to be finished on time. This Thursday they had gotten a bit ahead of their schedule. Why don't you go on home, Rosa, said the supervisor. I know your mother is feeling poorly and you might want to look in on her. The supervisor knew that Rosa would work until the work was done. But it was only December 1st. No need to push. Rosa appreciated that. Now she could get home early and since Raymond would be working late, maybe she could surprise him with his, fa his favorite, meatloaf. See you in the morning, Rosa waved goodbye and headed for the bus stop. She fiddled in her pocket for the dime so that she would not have to ask for change. When she stepped up to draw her fare in, she was smiling in anticipation of the nice dinner she would make. As the evil custom, she then got off the bus and went to the back of the door to enter the bus from the rear. Rosa saw that the section reserved for blacks was full, but she noticed the neutral section, the part of the bus where blacks or whites could sit, had free seats. The left side of the, of the aisle had two seats, and on the right side, a man was sitting next to the window. Rosa decided to sit next to him. She did not remember his name, but she definitely knew his face. His son, Jimmy, frequently came to the NAACP Unit Council Affairs. They exchanged pleasantries as the bus pulled away from the curb. Rosa settled her sewing bag in her purse next near her knees. Trying not to crowd Jimmy's father. Men take up more space, she was thinking, as she tried to squeeze her packages closer. The bus made several more stops, and the two seats opposite her fil were filled by blacks. She sat on the side of the aisle daydreaming about her good day and planning on this special meal for her husband. I said, give me those seats, the bus driver bellowed. Miss Parks looked up in surprise. The two men on the opposite side of the aisle were rising to move into the crowded black section. Jimmy's father muttered more to himself than anyone else. I don't feel like getting in trouble today. I'm going to move. Miss Parks stood to let him out, looked at James Blake, the bus driver, and then sat back down. You better make it easy on yourself, Blake yelled. Why do you pick on us, Miss Parks asked with the quiet strength of hers. I'm going to call the police, Blake threatened. Do what you must, Miss Parks quietly replied. She was not frightened. She was not going to give in to that which was wrong. Some of the white people were saying aloud, She ought to be arrested and take her off of this bus. Some of the black people, recognizing the potential for ugliness, got off the bus. Others stayed on and saying among themselves, That is the neutral section. She has a right to be there. Miss Parks sat. As Miss Parks sat waiting for the police to come, she thought of all the brave men and women, boys and girls, who stood tall for civil rights. She recited in her mind the 1954 Brown v. Board of Education decision, in which the United States Supreme Court set, ruled that separate is inherently unequal. She sighed as she realized that she was tired. Nope, not tired from work, but tired of putting up with white people first. Tired of stepping off sidewalks to let white people pass. Tired of eating at lunch counters and learning at separate schools. She was tired of colored inches, colored balconies, colored drinking fountains, and colored taxis. She was tired of getting somewhere first and being waited on last. Tired of separate and definitely tired of not equal. She thought about her mother and her grandmother and knew they would want her to be strong. She had not sought this moment, but she was ready for it. When the policeman bent down to ask, Auntie, are you going to move? All the strength of the people through all of those many years joined in her. 
Rosa Parks said no. Joanne Robinson was at the Piggly Wiggly when she learned of the arrest. She had stopped in a purchase of macaroni and cheese. She always served macaroni and cheese when she baked Red Snapper for dinner. A sister member of the P Women's Political Council approached her just as she reached the checkout line. Not Miss Parks, Miss Robinson exclaimed. She then looked furtively around. Passed the word that everybody should meet at my office at 10 o'clock tonight, she said. Miss Robinson was also Dr. Robinson, a professor at Alabama State, the college designated for colored people, and she was the newly elected president of the Women's Political Council. She rushed home to put dinner on the table, cleaned up the kitchen, and put the kids to bed. She kissed her husband goodbye and hurried to the college. It was dark when they finally gathered. The 25 women first held hands in prayers and hopes that they were doing the right thing. After all, they were going to use the stencil maker, printer, and paper of Alabama State without permission. If they were caught at the college, they could all be arrested for trespassing. But they were working to undermine a vicious law. They decided to stand under the umbrella of courage Rosa Parks had offered, keeping off the reins and fear of self-disgust. The women quickly formed groups to carry out each tax. Making the stencils was the most difficult because the machine keys had been struck very hard so the letters would be clearly read readable. If a mistake was made, the whole page had to be thrown out. It looked like a lot of concentration. The posters read, No riders today. Support Miss Park. Stay off the buses. Walk on Monday. The women made enough posters for almost every citizen of color in Montgomery. The next morning, as people read the posters, they remembered the joy they felt when the Supreme Court had declared that separate was not equal. They were sure that once the highest court in the land had spoken, they would not be treated so badly. But this was not the case. Soon after the ruling, Emmett Till, a 14-year-old boy in Money, Mississippi, was viciously, viciously lynched. At his funeral, more than 100,000 people mourned his, with his mother. She left his casket open, saying, I want the world to see what they did to my boy. Now, only weeks later, after his killers were free, Rosa Parks had taken a courageous stand. The people were ready to stand with her. They came together in a great mass meeting, the Women's Political Council, the NAACP, and all the churches. They needed someone to speak for them, to give a voice to the injustice. Everyone agreed that the river Martin Luther King Jr. would be an ideal. We will stay off the buses, Dr. King intentioned. We will walk until justice runs down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. And the people walked. They walked in the rain. They walked in the hot sun. They walked early in the morning. They walked late at night. They walked at Christmas and they walked at Easter. They walked on the 4th of July. They walked on Labor Day. They walked on Thanksgiving and then it was almost Christmas again. They still walked. People from all over the United States sent shoes and coats and money so that the citizens of Montgomery could walk. Everyone was proud of their nonviolent movement, and their sole force that bound the community together would sustain many marches for the years of the struggle that were yet to come. On November 13, 1956, almost a year after the arrest of Rosa Parks, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled the segregation on buses and segregations at schools was illegal. Segregation was wrong. Rosa Parks said no so that the Supreme Court could remind the nation that the Constitution of the United States makes no provision for second-class citizenship. We are all equal under the law, and we are all entitled to its protection. The integrity, the dignity, the quiet strength of Rosa Parks turned her no into a yes for a change.